Ahoy there, Captain Benzi here, coming at you with another episode of the Cat Skull Academy, the series that aims to teach you everything you need to know about Eve Echoes. Today we're going to be looking at the different types of tanking, how to help your ship stay alive in combat, basically. Now, in EVE Echoes there are numerous different ways to do this, so what we're going to cover in this video is essentially what the difference between active and passive tanking are, what the difference between armor, shield and speed tanking is, and how resistances work. Now if you do enjoy this video or find it useful, let me know by hitting like on it, subscribe to the channel for all things EVE Echoes, and make sure to ding that notification bell so that you never miss an upload. Let me know what topics you want me to cover in future videos by commenting down below in the comment section, and of course if you want to go the extra mile to help support this channel, you can do so by joining us over on Patreon, the details are on screen now. That said and done, let's talk about the art of staying alive. In EVE Echoes, your ship's hit points are denoted by the three bars on the left-hand side of the ship's HUD at the bottom of the screen here. From the inside out, these are the ship's hull, or structure, protected by armor plating, and then on the very outside of all of that are the shields. Now ultimately, an armor-tanked ship, as often the case with Galente or Amar designs, essentially they're saying, well, I'm going to put on a whole ton of armor plating so that you never actually get to damage my ship's hull. Then something like a Kaldari shield tank says, well, I'm not even going to let you hit my armor, you're going to have the shields out first, you've got to deal with those. Then there's also speed tanking, which is often used on smaller ships, especially those of Minmatar design, where they basically say, <laughs> why are you guys even getting hit? If you don't get hit, you don't take damage. And those are all three very viable types of tanking, and different ships will favor different versions. Obviously there are some ships that can go into multiple different ways, and there are some ships that are most definitely one particular type of tank. We'll cover that in a moment. Before we get too far into this one though, we do need to talk about what the difference between an active and a passive tank is. Now, an active tank, the terminology of an active tank, is a tank that recharges or repairs faster than the damage coming in. This tends to use a lot of capacitor, but it is theoretically infinite. If you have capacitor stability and the damage incoming is less than the amount you can repair, then you will stay alive indefinitely. This is usually the case when you see someone using shield boosters or armor repairers. Passive tanking, on the other hand, takes a, a, a lot more of a passive approach to it, as the name would suggest. This uses a big tank that takes a long time to deplete. The idea here is that you've got enough time to either kill your target or to escape, and you don't have to worry about maintaining capacitor stability, you just outlive your opponent or survive them to get away. Before we can go too far into talking about how tanking works, I think it is vital to explain and understand first of all how damage resistance works. This brings us to the Dromiel's fitting page, and quite frankly, any excuse to showcase the Dromiel, because I love this ship. This is my favourite ship in EVE Echoes. Now looking at its attributes and fittings page, you can see here that its defence is a total of 3,974 hit points, and those are spread across the shield, armour and structure fairly evenly. This means the shield has 1,156 hit points, the armor has 1,156 hit points, and the structure has 1,023 hit points. The resistances are then denoted by the colored bars underneath, blue for electromagnetic, red for thermal, white for kinetic resistance, and orange for explosive resistance. Here you can see that the shield has high resistance to explosive damage, but no resistance at all to electromagnetic, whereas the armor flips this on its head. The armor is most resistant to electromagnetic damage and least resistant to explosive. Now, the, uh, an important way to think about this is to understand that the resistance also implies a vulnerability. Whereas the shield has a 0% electromagnetic resistance, that also means it has a 100% electromagnetic vulnerability. On the armor, however, the 50% resistance also equates to a 50% vulnerability. Now, what this means in layman's terms is that if someone were to shoot at you with a weapon that did exactly 100 electromagnetic damage, then the shield has no electromagnetic resistance. It is 100% vulnerable to electromagnetic damage, so 100% of that attack's damage would get through. On the other hand, the armor has a 50% uh, vulnerability to electromagnetic damage, so only 50% of the damage would actually get through. In this case, our 100 damage shot, only 50% would be applied to armor. Obviously, if they're firing at the shield, the full 100 would get through. Once they reach structure, 77.77% would get through. Um, that kind of thing, I'm sure you can see that there. Now, the main reason that we like to think of this as a form of vulnerability rather than just resistance is how stacking resistances worked. 
Now, if I were to put on an electromagnetic shield, uh, an electromagnetic shield rig onto this that gives a 30% increase to shield resistance, electromagnetic resistance, then that would be 30% electromagnetic resistance, a 70% vulnerability. So now suddenly that 100 electromagnetic shot is only going to do 70 damage to the shield. However, what if I then fitted a module to the ship that increased all of my uh, all of my resistances by 20%. That's an additional 20% electromagnetic onto the shield. It's already got 30%, we're adding 20% on. Would that be 50% vulnerability? No. No, it wouldn't. That would not be a 50% resistance. That bar would not suddenly go up to 50%. And here's why. Basically, think of it as that vulnerability. If you put that rig in that increases your shield's electromagnetic resistance by uh, to 30, that is a 70% vulnerability. The game then looks at the next biggest resistance and applies that to the ship. In this case, that's the 20% module that we're talking about. This 20% is then a 20% of the 70% vulnerability, and 20% of 70 is 14%. So then you take that original 30%, add the 14% that the second module stacks in, and you've suddenly got a 44% electromagnetic resistance on the ship. The way this works is this now means that it is impossible to ever reach, 99, uh, to reach a full 100% um, resistance on anything. If something hits you, it is guaranteed to do at least some damage, because you cannot hit 100% resistance. That means that whenever you stack something, not only do you get penalties for stacking the same type of module, um, you would also get that just natural penalty, because it starts with the biggest one applying its full amount, and then you reduce down from there. So let's talk about armor tanking first. Now this is mainly used by Galente and Amar pilots, but ultimately it's not exclusive to their ships, nor are their ships exclusively armor tanked, if that makes sense. Anyway, the advantages of armor tanking are that it is more capacitor efficient than shield tanking. You replenish more hit points per gigajoule spent. It has a higher natural resistance on your armor, which means your armor tends to take less damage overall anyway, meaning that you can usually repair it that little bit better there too. Shield recharges naturally as well, armor doesn't. This means that whilst you're repairing your armor, your shield can also be boosting itself naturally. It also means that if you pull up outside a station with an armor repairer active, you can get your armor all the way back up to 100%, dock and never have to pay a repair bill, assuming you don't hit hull. The downside though of armor, the main one, is that it is closer to hull. If your armor tank fails, you have less time to escape. A shield tank, obviously you've still got the armor and the hull to get through before you need to break away. Now let's look at the different modules that you can use in regards to armor tanking. First of all are the active uh, armor tanking modules, which are called repairers. Armor repairers, obviously you get small armor repairers, medium armor repairers, and large armor repairers. You even get remote armor repairers that can be on someone else's ship. Now what these do ultimately is they convert your recharging capacitor into armor hit points. They cycle, and at the end of that cycle, they apply a certain amount of repair. Here you can see that in the case of this Mark V small armor repairer, it repairs 104 armor hit points at the end of each activation, and each activation takes 6 seconds and costs 33.8 gigajoules. So here you can see that over 6 seconds, it turns 33.8 gigajoules into 104 armor hit points. It just heals up your armor. Now, being an active module, this means that if you are capacitor stable, and as long as the damage coming in is lower than the amount being repaired, this is theoretically infinite. As such, as long as your capacitor doesn't go down, if your capacitor is recharging faster than 33.8 gigajoules, and if the damage is not greater than 104 damage every 6 seconds, this will seemingly go on forever. Then we have armor plates, and there are two types of armor plates for each ship size. Here you can see for smalls you get Mark V 100mm reinforced steel plate, and you can also get a Mark V 200mm reinforced steel plate too. Now what these do is they add a passive amount of extra HP onto the ship's armor, as natural in this case with the Mark V you can see that that is giving 232 additional hit points to the armor just for having it fitted, and you can activate this to give an additional boost of armor. Here at the bottom you can see additional armor upon activation, 232. Now this does have an activation cost here of 138 gigajoules, it is fairly hefty to activate one of these, it's fairly costly, but 
it does last 25 seconds. If at the end of those 25 seconds that additional armor has not been used up, if it hasn't been cleared, it will dissipate naturally. So do be aware of that. There's then a 60 seconds reactivation delay before you can use it again. It is worth noting that these do also increase the weight of the ship that they're applied to. Annoyingly, it doesn't actually tell us here on the info page how much it increases the weight of the ship, but it does. Testing has shown that it does. It adds to the weight of your ship, which slows it down. It means you turn and align slower, you accelerate and decelerate slower, and your top speed is impacted by having these on which is why we have two versions. You've got the Mark 500 mm reinforced steel plate here and a Mark 5 200 mm reinforced steel plate here. You can see here, this one now has a bigger armor increase of 523. An additional armor upon activation again is 523. Everything else is exactly the same as the 100 mm version. Ultimately, it's got the same activation cost. It's got the same activation time and the same reactivation delay. But this one is heavier and will slow your ship down more. Finally then for armor, we have the armor hardeners. These come in two different varieties as well, adaptive and reactive. Let's have a look at the adaptive one first of all. Now what these do is you activate them. Here you can see it's got an activation cost of 10.2 gigajoules and each activation lasts 10 seconds. As long as the Mark V adaptive armor hardener here is, is working, as long as it's active, it will apply a 16.37% increase to all of your resistances across the board for armor. Sets across the board for electromagnetic, thermal, kinetic, and explosive. But remember, with how resistances work, this only applies into the vulnerability gap. As such, if your armor already has a 50% uh, resistance to electromagnetic, this doesn't take it up to 66.37. It only applies that 16.37 to the 50% vulnerability area. That ultimately works out as an 8.185% increase, giving a total electromagnetic increase of 58.185%. That will be the full resistance for electromagnetic on a standard armor with one of these active. Hopefully that makes sense. Looking then at the reactive armor hardener, this kind of does a similar thing, but it looks like it's a little bit worse, doesn't it? It's still a Mark V, but it's only doing 10.91% at the moment. Same activation cost of 10.2, same activation time of 10. What gives? Ultimately, what these do is they respond to incoming damage. If you are taking damage from a particular source, these will adapt, will, will react and start to uh, change accordingly. If you're taking a lot of electromagnetic damage, then that electromagnetic damage will increase accordingly. It doesn't happen instantly, and it does have to be damaged onto the armor. The reactive armor hardener has to actually be taking that damage in order to respond, to react, and start boosting up. Now this means that ultimately, if you're going up against a particular type of damage that you know, and it's going to be that same consistent type of damage over and over again, then a reactive armor hardener can actually be incredibly beneficial, because the amount of resistance will go higher than an equivalent level adaptive armor hardener. It takes a few hits to get to that point, and it is only on that particular type. Thus, if you're going up against someone using missiles, for example, because their damage is spread across all four types, the reactive armor hardener will struggle to actually keep up with that, and an adaptive would be a better option. The shield tanking modules follow a similar kind of idea, and we'll come to these next. Now, the advantages of shield tanking are that it protects your armor and hull, both of them, so there is more room for error. If your shield tank fails, they still have to clear through your armor and through your hull before you're destroyed, which can buy you just a few extra seconds to escape if things start going a bit wrong. Secondly, shields have a faster recharge. They recharge faster over small damage, and you will notice that the activation cycle for something like a shield booster is a smaller activation time than used for an armor repairer. This is great if you're taking lots of little bits of frequent damage as it allows you to keep topped up. The flip side of this, however, is that it is less capacitor efficient than armor repairing. You get fewer HPs per gigajoules of your capacitor spent when shield tanking. But looking at the active side of things then, let's have a look first of all at a Mark V small shield booster. Here you can see that this has an activation cost of 32.7 gigajoules and it activates every four seconds. Unlike armor repairers, shield boosters apply their repair at the beginning of their activation. You tap a shield booster, it boosts immediately. It then, if you switch it off, it's got the four second cooldown before you can activate it again. Here you can see it's a 69 shield boost amount every four seconds. 32.7 gigajoules of energy is turned into 69 shield hit points. It's not as much as it was with the armor repairers, but it is faster. 
can use a bit more of your capacitor in the process though. Second up then is the equivalent then of armor plates. Instead of armor plates, we have shield extenders. Here we have a Mark V small shield extender. And similar to with the armor, what these do is they give a passive amount of your shield hit points. In this case, you can see here, this one gives 465, um, 465 additional shield points there. And if you activate it, you get an additional 465. Like with the armor plates, activating it does use a large amount of capacitor, in this case 138 gigajoules, and it does have an, uh, a reactivation delay of 60 seconds. It, like the armor plates as well, it stays for 25 seconds. If you haven't used the full amount of shield boosted in 25 seconds, any remaining does dissipate and disappear. You can see here as well that by having this fitted, the signature radius of the ship is increased by 2 meters, which makes you that little bit easier to hit hit and lock onto. Ultimately, whereas the armor plates slow you down, extenders make you easier to lock and hit. Like with armor, there are then two hardening modules as well, though one of them does have a different name, and that's here, the Mark V Adaptive Invulnerability Field. This is basically the adaptive armor hardener, but for shields. Here you can see the shield damage resistance for this is 27.29 across the board. It does cost 30.7 gigajoules per activation and lasts for 10 seconds. You can see this uses a lot more capacitor than the armor tank version does, but it does also give a bigger amount of resistance. Again, remember that that only applies to the vulnerability section of a particular shield's resistance. So you're not necessarily getting that full 27.29 added straight on. Electromagnetic, if it's at zero, yeah, that'll be 27.29 that it sits at with this active, but it is based on that formula we talked about earlier in regards to how this applies to uh, other resistances. Then of course there are reactive shield hardeners. These are similar to the armor hardeners in that you activate those and as long as it's active, any damage coming in will increase the resistance of the damage type taken. In this case, it starts off as 13.64% across the board, but if you're taking particular damage, if for example, someone's shooting at you with kinetic damage, then this reactive shield hardener will increase your resistance to uh, incoming kinetic damage. You will see that sometimes the other ones decrease accordingly as well. If you're not taking any damage from a particular type, that type will decrease to pump into the increased side. Very, very useful if you know what type of damage you're going up against. But again, like with the armor hardeners, it is on, uh, it's only better if you're having a unified form of damage coming in. Otherwise, use those ad in adaptive invulnerability fields. Now it's worth mentioning that there are a couple of different tanking modules that aren't really included in either shield tanking or armor tanking. The first of these is the damage control unit, also known as a DCU. Here you can see that these apply an amount of shield, armor, and structure resistance across the board. And that's just for having this fitted. This does not need to be activated. It passively increases all of your resistances, whether that's shield, armor, structure, whether it's electromagnetic, thermal, kinetic, or explosive. All of them are passively increased with no capacitor required. That said, however, you can activate a damage control unit. Here you can see it's got an activation cost of 138 gigajoules, and activating it will massively increase those boosts. You'll see here 800% boost to those resistances. So that means rather than the 6.82, that's going to be an 800% increase on that 6.82, making it very, very high resistance for the duration of the damage control unit. You'll see that it activates here for 13 seconds. It then has an exceptionally long activation delay of 150 seconds. That means once you've used these, you've got 13 seconds of massively increased resistances, probably very little damage, if any, coming in. But once it's off, you've got 150 seconds before you can use it again. Very, very long cooldown. This makes it exceptionally useful if you're going up against burst damage. Very useful, especially for PvP, because you're only engaging one target, you're expecting them to, deal, to start dealing damage, you activate the damage control unit, and you just buffer against all of that incoming damage, hopefully long enough to kill them, or at least get them down to low enough that the your tank otherwise can deal with it after. There is one final module to look at, and these are small hull repairers. These are exceptionally rare. I found one of these in one of the mission crates that I got. They don't seem to be tradable. I can't send them to anyone, and they don't appear on the market because they're untradable. You can't sell them. But what this does is kind of like an armor repairer, but for your hull. You can see here, 169 structure gets repaired every 12 seconds for 39.6 gigajoules. Now, ultimately, I'll be completely frank. Hull repairers and hull tanking is not 
really a thing in Echoes. These are so rare and hard to get hold of, I can't even really test it, but frankly, I just don't see that there is a ship that I would bother to. I would rather keep things on the armor or on shields, rather than dancing around on the edge of death, hoping that one of these things works. If you happen to get one of these, hold on to it as a curiosity. If you've got a particular ship that has a spare low slot and you've got nothing else to put in it, yeah, sure, put one of these in, if only for the fact that if you survive combat with a little bit of hull damage, you can repair it with this, and then your armor repairers can repair the armor damage, and then the shield just restores naturally, thus stopping you ever having to pay a repair bill. That is literally the only use I can think of for one of these. I just... I just, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever fit this to something if I'm being completely honest. I cannot think of a single ship where that is remotely useful. But hey, let me know in the comments section below. Maybe you've found some of these and you've got a tank, a ship that you are hull tanking with. I'd love to see that. Let me know. There is one final type of tanking that I should mention in this video, albeit briefly because I've talked about it elsewhere, and that is speed tanking. And it also gives me an excuse to talk about the Dromiel again, because I love the Dromiel. Now, speed tanking essentially is the concept of not getting hit. Essentially, if an armor tank is saying, my armor's too thick for you to hit my hull, and a shield tank says, my shield's recharged too fast for you to even hit the armor, then a speed tank laughs as he flies past, screaming, you guys get hit? Yeah, basically, you don't need to worry about absorbing or repairing damage if you don't get hit to begin with. Now, in order to pull this off, you need a ship that has both a small signature radius and can maintain a fast angular velocity. Now, angular velocity is kind of the speed that you move across something's vision. If you think of the sun orbiting the Earth, it takes 24 hours for it to orbit our planet, which works out at about 15 degrees across the sky every hour. An easier way to think of that, perhaps, is a 36 second orbit. If it takes you 36 seconds to do the full 360 degrees orbit around a ship, then you are flying at 10 degrees per second as angular velocity. That's not a good angular velocity, by the way. You'd need to have faster than that. Now, to get a good angular velocity, you need to have a small mass and a decent inertia modifier ratio. Those two get, allow you to turn sharply, and you need a good uh, flight velocity. In the case here, you can see the Dromiel has a flight velocity of 477. It's got a fairly slow, a uh, fairly low mass, and a fairly tight inertia modifier. Of course, when you have a Dromiel, you tend to also fit it with a polycarbon engine housing, which reduces that inertia modifier even further, allowing you to maintain a tighter orbit. So 477 meters per second with a tight orbit is going to get us a decent angular velocity. Does this ship have a small signature radius? Well, yes, 20.6 meters is actually smaller than the capsule. Ultimately, I like to attribute that to the fact that the Dromiel probably has all kinds of sensor dampeners and things on it, whereas a capsule, well, it's a fairly obvious thing drifting in space. Ultimately, the idea here is that, yes, if you can find a ship that can maintain a good angular velocity and has a small signature radius, that's going to be something that you can do some good speed tanking with. Look especially at the Tier 4 Interceptors. They have a very small signature radius and they get bonuses to Afterburner as well, meaning they get that very fast flight velocity, something that you'll have seen me talk about in that particular video. And there we have it, everything that you need to know about the different types of tanking. Obviously, if your ship is small and fast enough to go for uh, speed tanking, awesome, good luck to you. But if it's not, then now you should have an understanding of what armor tanking is, what shield tanking is, and how they work. Obviously, if you're looking at a ship and you can see that its armor HP is twice the size of its shield HP, or if it's got bonuses to something like shield booster amount, that kind of thing, you should already have an understanding of what type of tank that is. Now, thanks to this video, hopefully you'll have a concept of how to actually fit it and what the different types of tanking are and how they work. Anyway, let me know in the comments section down below how you get on with this one. What type of ships are you enjoying? What kind Have you done any ships that use an unusual type of tank? For example, there are some ships out there that are traditionally shield tanked that you might actually get away with using an armor tank. Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments section down below. And of course, take screenshots, post them to Twitter, and use the hashtag CSKL to showcase those two. I'd love to see the different types of tanks that you guys are using and all the different ships that you're flying. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!